Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. Today we're going to look at molecules of life. So in biology, carbon chemistry is really important, and that's because carbon is a very versatile atom because it has four electrons in its outer electron shell, so that leaves four spaces, you know, four different areas where it would like to fill those, and so what it ends up doing is, is sharing. So it shares its uh, those extra four spaces, and so you end up with the possibility of forming these endless amounts of chains and circles and rings, and you can even double bond sometimes. So a huge diversity of bonding patterns can take place because of carbon's um, outer electron shell. The simplest organic compounds are things like carbohydrates, where you have just carbon and hydrogen. But you can also make organic compounds more complicated by adding functional groups. So instead of a hydrogen here, we have an OH, so that's called a hydroxyl group. Or a carbonyl group, here is a double bonded O. An amino group, a carboxyl group, and so forth. And there's others. These are four of the most common ones. So whenever you make a macromolecule, you start off with what's with a single unit, and you add multiple units to that, kind of like train cars in a, in a train. And so we call the single units monomers and the long train a polymer. And the process that does this, where you link these monomers to become long polymers, is called dehydration synthesis. And this is because on one of the, like the shorter polymer here, we're actually going to take a hydrogen, and from the monomer we're going to take the OH, and O and two H's is water, and so what we're doing is we're getting water out and then building this larger. So dehydration, to dehydrate, to take water out. Synthesis, to make lar larger. Organisms also have to break down macromolecules, right? You eat food, it goes into your gut, and eventually it needs to be broken down, broken down, and then broken down by the cells so that your mitochondria can take advantage of the glucose and, and make energy. And the process that does this is called hydrolysis. And again, if you look at the roots here, hydro means to add water, lysis means to break apart. So you add water and you break apart. <clears throat> there are four categories then of large molecules in cells. The first is carbohydrates, then lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And we'll look at these one at a time. So the first is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates include things like sugars and starch molecules, um, fiber, and so forth. And what's interesting is if you look at this example between glucose and fructose, and you count up the number of C's and the number of O's and the number of H's, you'll see that they have the exact same chemical formula, C6, H12, O6. But the difference is where this double bonded O occurs, and that does make a big difference. Glucose is a sugar that gives immediate energy, and it's really easy to get lots of energy out of it. Fructose, on the other hand, actually is sweet to the taste, and um, also gives some energy, but not quite as quickly as glucose. You can also put the, these glucoses and fructoses and stick them together in long, long chains and make um, starch. And the way, again, that this is done is you take a glucose and a glucose, and through the process of dehydration synthesis, you now make a disaccharide called maltose. You can do the same thing with glucose and, um, and a fructose and make sucrose, or table sugar. Polysaccharides, then, are usually a bunch of glucose monomers all stuck together. So starch molecules are, that's exactly what starch is. It's a single-stranded glucose polymer. That is all that is this big long chain, and it turns out that that's really e that's a wonderful way to store energy because you can you can break off one of these at a time, use that energy, and so it's it's lots of energy available over a long period of time, and that's why you know athletes or whatever before a a big sporting event they may eat starchy foods the night before. Glycogen, like found in muscle, also is a polymer of glucose, but it's wound up on itself, so it's a little bit more difficult to break that apart. The energy is still there and still available, but it's even more long-term. And then cellulose, the way that it is fit together in these, um, in these cellulose fibers, it's actually not available for taking advantage of the energy there that's in the glucose. So for example, organisms like cows that eat 
you know, just grass, they actually have to house special bacteria and other symbionts inside of their guts to help them first break down the, the cellulose into more simple forms of starch and then their bodies can process them and take advantage of that energy. The second kind of macromolecules we'll talk about are lipids or fats. And basically to have a fat molecule, you take a glycerol molecule, you add a fatty acid chain over here, and again through the process of dehydration synthesis, you now have three fatty acids connected to a glycerol. That's called a triglyceride. And in this case, it happens to be an unsaturated triglyceride because there's a double bonded um, a double bond right here, and so it puts a little kink in, in this long chain, which means that these molecules then end up being more spread out, and this is why at room temperature, um, unsaturated fats are liquid, whereas if this was saturated, where there was an, you know the total possible number of hydrogens with no double bonds, and all three of these chains were straight out, you can pa pack those more closely together, and so at room temperature, saturated fats are solids, like butter or lard. Some lipids also can be made into steroids. And so if you take a cholesterol, right, which is part of our diet as well, cholesterol is actually necessary to form the steroids testosterone and some estrogens. Proteins are the third type of macromolecules that are important for life. And these are just a few examples of proteins. We're actually going to talk a lot about proteins in many of the other lectures. but. Proteins can be involved in structure, in storage, as contractile elements like in muscles, transport proteins, for example, in the blood. So proteins are really um, uh, an amazing part of life. They're also used as the enzymes and, and they're embedded in all of the membranes of every cell. They're really, really important. We'll talk much more about proteins later on, but I first want to just mention how they're built up. They're also built up from monomers being put together to form a long polyp polymer, but in this case the monomer is what's called an amino acid. An amino acid is formed of a carbon in the middle, hydrogen on the top, an amino group, a carboxyl group, and then the side group. And the side group is what changes. And as that side group changes, it, it um, is variable for all 20 amino acids. So we have 20 different amino acids. And so the way that you do this is you take two amino acids. Again, through the process of dehydration synthesis, you now form a special type of covalent bond called the peptide bond. And in this case, this is why if you add a bunch of these together, you end up having a polypeptide or a growing chain of amino acids that will become a protein. Proteins, once they get built in this big long amino acid chain, right, this polypeptide here, it folds up on itself. And it does this first by having a, um, so that's called the primary structure, the big the, the chain itself, the, the, the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure, this, these ribbons will, will fold back on themselves into pleated sheets or they can go into a coil and become an alpha helix. You can also then take those secondary structures and bend them and, and, and fold up on themselves to become tertiary structure. And then you can even bring a bunch of these chains together and have um, quaternary structure. So the important thing about a protein though is that it has shape and the shape is determined by the underlying primary sequence and then it folds up on itself in a very specific way and has shape and the shape is what allows it to do whatever its job is to do. And the fourth type of macromolecule that we'll look at are nucleic acids. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and these are the information storage molecules of life. Here's an example of a nucleotide that's called thiamine and you can see it has a sugar, a phosphate group, and then a nitrogenous base. And this is what can differ to make each of the different DNA molecules, the DNA nucleotides. You can have either A, G, C, or T in DNA. And here are the different structures of those nitrogenous bases. And that's what they stand for. A is adenine, G is guanine, T is thiamine, and C is cytosine. And so these monomers, these nucleotides, get linked together into big long chains where you have the phosphate sugar alternating as part of the backbone and then the nitrogenous bases sticking out to the side like rungs on a ladder. 
and that's one side of the DNA molecule, and then the other side of the DNA molecule is also the same thing, sugar phosphate backbone with nitrogenous bases sticking out. And then these nitrogenous bases base pair to each other. G's always to C's and A's always to, to T's, and that is what we call the DNA double helix. Now in RNA, it's, it, it's somewhat similar to DNA where you have a sugar, a phosphate group, and the nitrogenous base. Three of the bases are the same, A, G, and C, but you do not have now a T or thymine, rather now you have a U or uracil. So the three differences are, one, RNA is single-stranded, two, RNA has a ribose sugar instead of a deoxyribose sugar, and three, RNA has uracil instead of thiamine. And that's the end of the, ma the main macromolecules that are used in life.